Welcome to Rodera. Today we are talking about China and the book that we have in focus is China's Great Wall of Debt, Shadow Banks, Ghost Cities, Massive Loans and the End of Chinese Miracle. For almost four decades, uh, China had a rapid rise and most of the uh, growth that we have seen in China is nothing but impressive. Um, in fact, many have come to believe that the alternative model of economic growth and development is something where we look to China and copy it. Well, once the communist nation was struggling to feed its population basic manufacturing capabilities and was hardly seen as a rival for the superpower status. But only after four decades, China has not only moved millions of people from farms to factories and almost come to dominate several industries on a global scale. And now China is leading foreign investor or rather foreign investment source to many countries. However, analysts and commentators and politicians have been forecasting the demise of the Chinese rapid growth and impending Chinese crisis for more than two decades. Yet none of those prognoses have been realized. China's rapid rise generally equates with efficiency, technological advance, and fiscal prudence, and this is how Chinese government would like this to be seen. However, its investment-led boom driven by local officials is riddled with waste inefficiencies of epic proportions. To explain all these to us, today we have with us the author of the book, China's Great Wall of Debt, Dini McMahon. Welcome to Rodera. Thanks for having me, Manish. Thank you. Give us a little bit of sketch of how China has transformed itself uh, since mid 80s and how successful they have been, at least for the first two or three decades. And then we can go into how things changed since then. Okay. Well, it's been a, an absolutely phenomenal transformation. I mean, China emerged from the, the Cultural Revolution at the, in the mid to late 1970s. With, with you know very little you know, in the way of a, a in the way of a dynamic uh, economy i mean a lot of its industry um and its dynamism had been lost sort of decades ago and so um throughout the 1980s in particular and through the 1990s um you kind of had the the emergence of of a private sector of sort of small scale entrepreneurs but also in the 1990s you kind of had the the overhauling of of state owned industries you know uh, some of the most inefficient were let go um and the larger were kind of given uh were sort of exposed to more competitive forces and so particularly throughout the late 20th century he kind of had this overhauling of of the chinese economy injecting um, a, a nascent private sector injecting competition, forcing the private, the, the public sector to be more competitive and exposing them to market forces. And then the nature of that economic growth changed again in the 20th, 21st century. So even though you kind of saw a growth of the export machine in China throughout the 1990s, it was really supercharged then um, from 2001 onwards when China was uh, allowed into the World Trade Organization. And China's export machine really went into overdrive. Uh, and at the same time, you saw investment growth becoming a, a more and more significant driver of China's growth miracle. And what I mean by that is that it was investment in things like infra infrastructure and in housing. Because up until the late 1990s, China hadn't really had a, a free, open housing market for, for families. And when that changed, that all of a sudden opened up the door for people to kind of move out of their very cramped state provided uh, you know, housing uh, you know, and, and accommodation and go out and buy their own. And that kind of unleashed what's really been a 20 something year housing boom as people have progressively upgraded their, their, you know, their apartments and their housing conditions. And at the same time, as I mentioned, we kind of had this growth in infrastructure um, investment. Now, of course, that took up, started to take off in, in the 1990s as there was kind of demand for better infrastructure as the export machine took off and, you know, exporters need more, needed more reliable access to power and better ports and better roads. But it was really in the 21st century that local governments kind of, again, supercharged that investment. So in the 21st century, we had you know, the drivers of growth in part, particularly early on, was kind of exports supercharged by the World Trade Organization and then investment in infrastructure and housing. And that kind of brings us up to what really my book is about, because when we're talking about a great wall of debt, it's been de debt primarily incurred 
in the construction of housing, construction of, of you know, ex- perhaps the, the excessive construction of public works. And it's also been um, overinvestment in uh, certain industries by mainly the state sector as they have supplied primarily these, these construction industries. You explained very well in the book that the housing boom really is the land boom. And we will certainly go back to that a little bit later. But give us the overview of how the uh, investment boom and financial systems are linked. And this is coming from someone like you who has lived there for almost two decades. So you know it right from the ground over there, how things happen. So why there was, as you explained, that there was a need for to make the export more efficient. So the local authorities made a lot of investments uh, to make that export machine even more efficient. But how all that, dis- how all those decisions are made, how state companies or state governments or local governments are extremely influential in the decision making. Maybe you can explain to us how the Chinese economy is divided between the state control and the private sector and whatever foreign economy or foreign government or foreign companies are there. Right. I mean, there's a lot of aspects to this, but these days, you know, the, the China's role in, in, in sort of the state-owned economy is primarily what you'd consider as being upstream industries. And so uh, the state plays a, an outside role in, say, the production of metals like, you know, uh, you know aluminium, you know, the, the biggest steel producers are, are state-owned. In the production of energy and and, and and sort of the the transport of energy and, and and shipping and whatnot, so they kind of dominate upstream industries. Now, at the same time, they, the state also plays an outside role in you know industries in which the government believes uh, China needs to sort of develop its own strategic. Uh, role in so, for example, in in you know, Beijing has believed for a very long time that China needs to have its own aerospace industry, and so the state plays an outsized role in that as well. However, putting it like that doesn't really give you the the full extent of the state's in, involvement in the economy, because particularly at a local level, uh, local officials have an interest in supporting. Uh, state firms that they see as being important to supporting local economic interests. And so throughout the country, you'll find that a lot of property developers are owned by local state firms. So these are state firms that aren't owned by Beijing. They might be owned by at, at a provincial level or at a city level or at a county level. And then you get all sorts of companies that really there are no good reason for them to be state owned at all. It's kind of a historical legacy or some local state government official or state you know, company manager saw an opportunity and, and sort of used whatever resources they had at their disposal to move into. So you have a ridiculous situation where there are state-owned theme parks or there are state-owned traditional Chinese medicine companies. So you kind of have the whole gamut of what the state owns. In theory, what, the, what Beijing would like to see is that the state plays a, a strategic role in the commanding heights of, 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 of the economy. But once you get down to a local level, local officials have their own incentive for controlling equity in local state firms. Now, of course, when we're talking about the, the, the private sector, the private sector kind of moves into those parts of the economy in which either the state isn't a competitor or there is sort of sufficient space for them to kind of coexist alongside the state. Or, as we've seen in the last few years, they move into industri- into new industries in which there isn't a pre-existing state presence. And so you have perhaps China's biggest private companies, the, 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 the company names that are perhaps best recognized around the world are in, say, the tech sector, because they, they have kind of built these industries from, from the ground up without any pre-existing state competition. And by that, I'm talking about companies like Alibaba and Tencent. Then as for foreign investment in China, Traditionally, that was in the export sector. And so when um, foreign firms first started moving into China in the early 1990s, they were there to take advantage of of cheap Chinese labor, cheap Chinese land, and produce goods in China almost exclusively for export. Now, that has changed somewhat over the last three decades because China went from a, a source of 
of cheap uh, uh, went from being a, a cheap manufacturing base, which it no longer is. Um, and the appeal of China has become very much about tapping China's domestic market. It's very much become about selling into China's dom uh, you know domestic market to the 1.2, 1.3 billion consumers. And so the presence of, of foreign firms these days uh, is, is kind of it's kind of throughout all sorts of industries from, uh, you know, there's still a significant export presence, but it's also about they're in joint ventures manufacturing cars in China or, you know, DuPont is there pr producing chemicals that get fed into China's industrial supply chain. Um, and so there is a, a sort of a, an ubiquitous foreign uh, foreign presence throughout China. Although the, the foreign, the, the complaint um, become far more acute in recent years is that foreign firms do not get treated you know in the same way as local firms in, in the sense that they're, they're not they're not competing on a, on an uh, on an equal playing field um, and this has been a, a complaint that European and American firms in particular have been making more and more vociferously in, in recent years um, so maybe I'll leave my answer there to, to start with if we want to go into the financing of any of this I'll, I'll, I'll leave that in your hands Manish but at least that gives us an overview as to kind of how you know the, the the structure and ownership of Chinese industry? No, this helps definitely. Uh, as you bring it up in the book, is there are more than one hundred and fifty thousand government controlled entities out there, and I think they have almost uh, twenty five percent of the employment uh, in China that they provide, and I think roughly over fifty percent of the national income is is in their hands. I may be off a little bit with the numbers, but you can correct me as we go along. But that just shows the importance and dominance of the uh, of the uh, state. Uh, you also bring it up very well that there's a visible hand and there's an invisible hand. And you have some interesting comments from some of the Chinese leaders that how, how they view the visible and the invisible hand should play out. Yeah, I, I can't remember the, the actual quotes off, off hand, but really the Chinese perceive the role of the market and the role of the state as being very, very different to what we would in sort of liberal, you know, free market liberal democracy. So I think it was in 2013 um, where uh, the central government, the party, um, published a, a sort of a, a key new blueprint for the direction of, of the Chinese economy. And it said that from henceforth, the market would play a decisive role uh, in the economy. So market forces would play a decisive role in the economy, but the state would continue to play a dominant role. And to outside observers, that looked you know, that almost looked contradictory. Now, at first, it's, it's important to point out that previously market forces were only to play a basic role. So being promoted to a decisive role in 2013 looked really quite significant. The question was, how can it play a decisive role if the state is still playing a dominant role? And if anything, that kind of encapsulates the way that the party and the state sees the role of the market. They see the market and market forces as having a an important role in the allocation of resources. So today, any number of markets in China are on a day-to-day -day basis uh, driven by market forces. So if you take the housing market, for example, on a day-to-day -day basis, supply and demand and the price at which supply meets demand, that really comes down to market forces. It's a decision that's made between the buyer of a house, the seller of a house, the property developers, the banks that are providing the credit. It's all those forces coming together to, you know, to uh, ensure that supply, so demand meets supply and, and, and vice, vice versa. But the state reserves the right to intervene in a market, any market, when the outcome of those market forces is something that the state either views as being undesirable or unstable or, or just really for any reason or even for political reasons, views that it is necessary for the state to, to intervene. And you see that constantly through all markets. I mean, with the housing market, both the central government and the local government are constantly tinkering with the supply of credit, not just through you know interest rates, but by changing the rules of who can buy what apartment, when, under what circumstances, to try and prevent the market from overheating, but also ensure that there is always sufficient demand such that you know this property sector, which is a key driver of economic growth, continues to continue to to contribute to economic growth, or you see in uh, the, the the stock market that you know if if the government is worried that the market isn't as healthy as perhaps they'd like to see, they'll put a moratorium on initial public offerings. 
So there'll be traditionally there'll there've been extended periods of time where no new firms have been listed because the government has been worried that new firms will suck up liquidity and, and force prices down further. So you know, you mentioned that it's this, this contrast between a visible hand or this balance between what is the role of the visible hand and the invisible hand. The Chinese also have an expression which best translates as the restless hand, because this visible hand, this, this government involving itself in what we often see as, as being market decisions, it's often, often very fidgety. It's often constant sort of trying to tweak around the edges to kind of get the outcomes that they want. And so the Chinese often refer to this as being the restless hand. But you do have this situation where, for the most part, market forces play a far greater role in the Chinese economy today than at really any point since the Chinese Communist Party took over the, the People's Republic of China. But at the same time, the authorities reserve the right to intervene in the market whenever they deem fit. And that's something that I think foreign observers always kind of struggle with, this idea that the market can be both decisive but the state dominant. Um, that those two kind of uh, ideas, which are naturally intense, in tension, can coexist in a meaningful way in, in a large dynamic economy like that of China's. So if you're a private manufacturer or if you're a private bank or if you're a private service providers, you just never know because you're always constantly worrying about are you overstepping and when the state will intervene. So you always have to be overcautious. That's not a bad way of putting it. I, I think any business person in China, regardless of, of whether they're running a foreign business or they're a Chinese entrepreneur, or even if they're working for a state company, they have to constantly be aware of you know, not just how and when the state might intervene in the market, but also the, the political par parameters under which they're operating how much they can, the, the, the political parameters under which they're operating is perhaps the, the best way to, to describe it. Because there is this kind of constant ebb and flow uh, between what is officially sanctioned, what is generally permitted, and what is kind of you know out of bounds, so to speak. Uh, and I think we've seen very recently the most tangible manifestations of that with what is it's kind of broadly regarded as kind of a crackdown on the tech sector, crackdown on, on the tutoring sector, crackdown on the on the gaming sector. So what we've seen in recent weeks is that uh, Beijing put out a decree saying that all education companies must re-register now to be non-profit. Now this was effectively a, I think a hundred billion dollar industry. You've got something like two or three, three or four dozen companies listed in the U.S. that are Chinese education companies that uh, have kind of tapped into this overwhelming demand among mainly middle you know, middle class um, Chinese urban families for tutoring services for, for their children. Well, it's been a huge dynamic industry. And yet overnight, the central government has effectively said, okay, this is now a non-profit industry, which has completely turned it upside down. And so, you know, that kind of change is far more abrupt and its implementation far more hand-fisted than, than typically what you see in China. But it's not unusual in the sense that industries often find that the outer limits of what is permitted and what isn't, sort of you know, areas in which they've kind of pushed the envelope or new businesses they've set up or ways in which they have conducted their businesses in the past are no longer permitted under the prevailing sort of political um, environment because Beijing's priorities have, have changed. And so, you know, we've seen this with the tech sector as well, where after years of relatively light touch regulation of, of the tech sector and it's, you know, a willingness to see it exp expand into, you know, see the internet platforms expand into fintech um, or to, you know, ex experiment with, you know, new industries and whatnot, all of a sudden Beijing is uh, reigning in the freedom of the internet platforms because it's gone, okay, well, we're seeing that the tech sectors, uh, the internet platforms, they are abusing consumer information. And in fact, they've become so big that their behavior has become anti-competitive and that's not in our interest. So again, it's this situation where, uh, you know, the, the boundaries of what is permitted are, are constantly shifting. And any business owner or business manager or entrepreneur has to be sensitive kind of 
you know, have a finger to the wind to get a sense of how are things changing and making sure that they are not caught flat-footed, you know, when those changes occur. Because usually, I mean, they don't occur in a, in a, in a platform. I mean, the central authorities or, or, the, or the media uh, typically are able to signal that changes are in the wind, and it give, usually gives people at least some time to kind of, you know, adjust their, their behavior. Of course, it's never quite as simple as that, but that, that's kind of the, uh, you know, the, the idea that it's a very, you know, to, to, to be a successful business person, you kind of have to be aware of this flux. Of course, and we will tie all this thing together with the financial systems because someone who is thinking right now what this all has to do with the great wall of debt, don't worry, you will find out. We just need to understand how the decision process or decision process or decision making process works. Let's focus a little bit on the um, what happens at the uh, local level, because even though we call it as a central command or centrally planned or centralized economy, China is very localized economy. And many times what most people know is there's uh, enormous overcapacity in many industries. Industries after industries have gigantic overcapacities. The question is how does this happen and why Beijing allows all these things to happen? And let's tackle that first. So what happens when Beijing says let's go and make solar panel or let's go and make steel and steel is a perfect example, solar panel is another good example, shipbuilding is another example. Well, let's take any of these examples and try to kind of walk us through when those decisions are made and then how the local governments or local regions are allowed to compete with each other and how that competition becomes a zero sum game. Well, the, the starting point, I, I think, really is, is with the local governments, because when central government puts out a decree, it often issues merely the bare bones of what it wants. So it'll say, hey, this particular industry, let's say robotics, that is a priority. It's important to China's economic future and to its national security. Therefore, that's become a priority and we want to achieve certain benchmarks within 10 to 15 years. So local governments then hear that, and it often falls to them to help realize Beijing's vision. But the problem with that is then you have a situation where a whole lot of provinces, and then within the provinces, cities or, or counties, are effectively competing against each other. Now, on one level, that's a good thing, because in a perfect environment, it means that you know different locales are coming up with different ideas as to how to realize Beijing's vision. Ideally, they might actually focus on different aspects of, of robotics. But so often you have a situation where everybody effectively uh, applies the same model. They uh, say that, hey, you know, if you set up a robotics company or if you are a robotics PhD and you, you want to set up a robotics company, if you're an existing company and want to expand into robotics, then we will give you cheap or even free land um, and we will give you tax breaks and perhaps even we'll, we'll give you uh, cash subsidies for a period of time. Different provinces in different counties in different cities, that same or similar raft of incentives appears and all of a sudden a whole lot of firms are taking advantage of it. Then it's a question of what's happening on the firm side. And industrial overcapacity has a couple of different aspects to it as it applies to the state sector and to the private sector. So overcapacity does exist in the private sector as well. So if you take something like robotics, a lot of the overcapacity that's emerged in the robotics sector in China has been driven by small private firms that are just taking advantage of, of the government incentives uh, available. And you ended up with a, in a situation where China has been producing far more low-end robots than really there is any need for. And it's not really realizing Beijing's vision of a kind of a more technologically and innovative robotic sector, which is kind of what Beijing had had in mind. But at the other side, at the other end of the of the spectrum is uh, with state owned firms. And as you mentioned, Manish, we've had this problem of overcapacity in in shipping, in uh, aluminium, in steel, in, all, in a whole raft of industries. And that is primarily, but not exclusively, led by state-owned firms. And so with state-owned firms, the, the driving motivation is not profit, right? So in free market economies, 
A firm lives and dies really by how much profit it can generate. But with state-owned firms, it's a little bit different, and that's for two reasons. One is because the managers of state firms have have a, a, a sort of a, a, a host of political incentives that they are supposed to fulfill. And so let's say if you take the current political environment, you know, state firms are, you know, Beijing is very concerned about unemployment, particularly among students. And so there is a responsibility for state firms to maintain employment levels, to employ students from universities. At the same time, there is this pressure to improve improve or, or spend more on research and development something again that falls on state firms. And so you have these non-market motivations and incentives that managers of state firms have to consider. And and so that, you know, of course, that by definition then dilutes the the motivation to to generate profit. Now, at the same time, profit at a state firm isn't really profit as we would recognise it because state firms so often have access to cheap land. Maybe they, they own the land because they, they were given it 20 years ago, or maybe they are paying exceptionally cheap rent for it. Often they have access to subsidized utilities, so they're not paying full price for, for water or for electricity. Um, at the same time, they invariably get access to far cheaper uh, credit lines than would otherwise be the case if they were operating on a, on a free market basis. And often they might be getting cash subsidies from, from local governments. And so you take all of that into account and any profit that a state-owned firm generates isn't profit as we understand it. They're able to generate profit because so many of their inputs are far cheaper than they would be or should be under a free market situation. So that's, that's the other thing to keep in mind. And so you have this situation where the driving motivation for state-owned managers isn't to generate profit, but it is mainly political considerations. And in this sort of world, the way that you maximize your influence um, and your status within the political system is size and pace of growth. It is your ability to be able to command more financial resources, sorry, more resources, financial and otherwise, than your competitors are. And so there is this drive towards growth. And so that in and of itself uh, generates this, this inclination towards overcapacity because there's a sense that, look, the most important thing to do is to achieve market share and we'll deal with profitability later. So a whole lot of SOEs in competition with each other, say in the aluminium industry or the uh, shipbuilding industry, they're all competing with each other, but the short-term motivation is to maximize their size and they'll deal with the consequences later. Now you take those motivations and combine them with the local government um, considerations and you have local governments who are willing to protect um, firms, whether they be private firms or state firms, that commit to building additional factories, whether the broader economy needs them or not, in their local uh, in their local area. Firstly, by giving them subsidies, and secondly, more often than not, by throwing up uh, internal barriers to competition with other parts of the country. And there was a, a famous Chinese economist called Zhang Weiying who was had a reputation as being China's preeminent free market economist. And he said, he said that, look, whenever China talks about the need for uh, you know, free markets and tearing down market barriers globally and internationally, you've got to keep in mind that one of the reasons China's doing that is because it's found it so difficult to break down internal trade barriers. And, you know, when we're talking internal trade barriers, we're not talking about uh, tariffs between one province or another or one county and another. They're more kind of informal administrative barriers, which makes it difficult, for example, for a steel mill in another province to perhaps uh, sell its steel in another county uh, when that county has its own steel producer and is doing everything it can to support the, the, the economic Um, interests of that producer. Now, of course, there's one other uh, element in all this as well, and that's taxes. So, you know, local, uh, you know, uh, local authorities, just the the way that the tax regime is set up is that if you have a company that is in an industry with industrial overcapacity, even if that company is losing money, 
the most important thing for the local governments is that that company still continues to produce and it still continues to sell because even if it isn't generating a profit, those sales will generate sales tax or that production, that additional production will still generate business taxes and it will generate sales taxes in that local community. And so even if the company isn't profitable, the local city or the local uh, government will still continue to to collect at least some taxes because of the way the tax structure is is structured in China. So you've got this very complex dynamic uh, where local governments and state the, the managers of state-owned firms have this kind of raft of incentives, which, when they all come together, kind of create this this perverse universe of incentives, which really feeds into uh, you know, the, 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 a system which naturally lends itself to, to creating industrial labor cap capacity. Now, of course, things are getting a little bit better at the moment. The the pace at which industrial labor capacity has growing is, is kind of it, it's kind of come to a bit of a stop in recent years because there has been a, a crackdown on credit creation. So some of the drivers of credit growth, the shadow has, has been contracting. Um, you know, bank lending has also sort of slowed down. And so the, the sort of the, the finance that was once readily available that made uh, expansion industrial capacity possible, that's not there anymore. But we can talk about that in more detail in a minute, if you like, Manish. Yes, and uh, with all those incentives that are aligned to create wrong or rather grow in the wrong direction uh, for in to exist in a low in a real economy on top of that you also have a very wrong benchmarking or or incentives even for the local government officials or mayors or the uh, uh, people who are responsible for managing those provinces and I think you mentioned that growth and tax revenue collection are the two most important things on which they are measured but also stability if there is a protest beyond a certain size then certainly their promotional prospects are pretty much gone. So all these incentives, not only for the public sector companies or SEOs, but also for the government officials, they all somehow conspire to create big, bigger and bigger, bigger, and then eventually it collapses, as we explained in the case of Herzog. That's right. They, they all sort of come together and, and until they're, they're no longer uh, sustainable. Certainly the the, the, the pressures on, on local government officials in, at, at the moment, or as has always been the case, is, is absolutely huge. But the, the dynamics ha have been changing a, a little bit um, since Xi Jinping launched his anti-corruption campaign. So all those incentives are, are pretty much the same, and the pressures on local government officials are, this, are the same, but they're all kind of becoming a lot more conservative and a lot lot more worried about what actions they can take to drive economic growth since the anti-corruption campaign. So that started in about 2013, I think it was, um, pretty much as Xi Jinping came to, to power. And that has a, you know, that Xi Jinping has kind of leveraged the, the fear that local officials uh, have of being nabbed for, for, for corruption to uh, an economic agenda, which is said, okay, you can no longer, um, you know, borrow freely for low, purely to drive, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the local economies. So to sort of back up a second, the dynamic for local officials uh, was was something like this. As you said, there were three main considerations. It was uh, their, their um, promotion prospects were primarily driven by the pace at which they could drive economic growth, the, their ability to generate tax revenues, and thirdly, their ability to, ins to maintain social stability. Now, the way that they drove the first two was by building stuff. I mean, it's, it's a gross simplification, but not by much. So uh, mayors in particular, they might be promoted into that role for formally for five-year stints, but more often than not, they'd get promoted after maybe three years. Now, three years is not a long time for a mayor to be able to prove their worth as an economic manager, certainly to be able to prove that they are capable of driving economic growth. So the way to do that, the easiest way to do that, is to borrow money and build something. And so that kind of became the model uh, throughout the entire country. 
that when a mayor moved into that role, they would immediately come up with a grandiose construction project that so often that would be building twin cities, effectively a new city or a, or a new industrial park or a new tourism zone. Um, or it would be about uh, massively investing in the city's infrastructure, whether it be new highways or subway, uh, subway systems or lobbying to get the highway rail, uh, the sort of the high speed rail network uh, connected to their town. But all of these things would require huge amounts of investment, and that required huge, huge amounts of borrowing, primarily from the banks and also from the bond market. Now, of course, the problem with this situation, or, or the great thing about this situation, is that this borrowing would create short term growth very, very quickly. However, and for the local mayors, this was fantastic because once you were promoted after three years, the problem of repaying those debts became somebody else's problem. You'd get promoted onto the next town and the person who replaced you would have to deal with the economic fallout. Now, of course, the way that so many of the replacement mayors and their replacements dealt with it is they would just borrow more. So you had this sort of doubling down effect of cities just borrowing more and more as mayors tried to prove that they could stimulate economic growth and, and the debt burden built up. Now, of course, some of these uh, investments uh, were sufficient to actually stimulate uh, economic activity. Um, but in a lot of cases, particularly in the smaller cities, you just ended up with cities with, with, a, with a massive debt burden. Uh, now, of course, the, under Xi Jinping, what has changed is she has said, look, if you are a mayor or you're a government official and you are responsible for uh, making a borrowing decision during your time at whatever city or whatever county, that decision follows you wherever you go. So if you get promoted onto the next city now, you don't really get to wash your hands of, of previous decisions. If that debt ultimately defaults uh, in eight years' time or seven years' time, even if you're not at that city anymore, if you are responsible for making that decision, that will be a black, you know, a black marker against your promotion, promotion prospects. And so the authorities have been trying to change this dynamic. And I think perhaps the bigger factor towards uh, changing this dynamic is that the availability of credit for local governments and pretty much for everybody in the economy, whether you're a state firm or a private firm or a local government, it just isn't what it used to be for various reasons. Uh, you've had a massive crackdown on the shadow banking system. When I wrote the book, it seemed absolutely impossible. The shadow banking system was just a balloon that just kept getting bigger and bigger. And any regulatory effort to try and crack down on it just seemed doomed to failure. Now, as I alluded to just a minute ago, the, shadow, the Xi Jinping's anti-corruption crackdown, that's what really changed things. Because whereas in the past, the financial system found ways to innovate around crackdowns on shadow banking system, effectively, they would uh, comply with the letter of whatever new regulation came down, but sort of flout its spirit. What's changed now is that that dynamic has, has flipped around, that it's less important to comply with the letter and it's more important, to uh, and more important to comply with the spirit of the regulations. And so what we've seen in the last three years is that shadow banking has been contracting and contracting quite aggressively. Uh, meanwhile, the pace of bank lending is far slower than it has been. Certainly, uh, it, it's, it's not enough to compensate for the contraction in shadow banking. And then you've had the government go after specific industries and so it is far more it's far harder for heavy polluting industries for example like the steel sector to borrow the way that it used to um, and 12 months ago you had a a very aggressive deleveraging campaign imposed on property developers such that they are not in a position to borrow as much as they they used to and the same also goes for for local local governments and so you have this situation where Sure, a, a lot of the, that same, you know, the, the incentives that drive local government officials have changed a, a little bit, but the thing that has really changed their behaviour is that the availability of the credit which previously allowed them to do what they did just isn't as readily available as it once was. In the Western economies, uh, the central bank plays a big role in deciding who 
gets money at what price and that is the interest rate. Interest rate is the driver in the Western economies or the economies that are far more efficient or developed. In China, the financial system is different. The Chinese government plays a different role in not controlling interest rate, but rather supplying credit and who gets credit and who does not. Maybe you can explain to us how the credit is created and how the credit, more important, is allocated over the last 15 years, what has happened and how that process has become the real source of the pro all the problems that we see in the wall of debt. No, absolutely. And this again comes back to what the, this is sort of the, the motivations of state-owned enterprises. Because as I said before, state-owned firms aren't driven by profit. And so that same dynamic affects or influences their ability to, or their willingness to borrow. So in you know in free market economies, a firm will a firm's borrowing decisions will be shaped by how expensive it is to borrow. Um, if interest rates go up, it'll make them reassess how much they they borrow and wh whether they're generating a, a enough income to be able to service their debts. But for state-owned firms in China, it's a little bit different because you know the, the motivation of 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 state firms isn't profit it is size and so it's about size and it's about influence and so even if interest rates go up or interest rates go down it's not fundamentally going to change the willingness of state firm managers to borrow and so you, you have a situation where even if the central bank was raising interest rates it's not going to change the willingness it's not going to necessarily change demand among the state sector for, for credit and the banks will continue lending accordingly so what that has meant traditionally is it then becomes necessary to ration credit. So traditionally, the banks have been constrained by a credit quota every quarter. And that has been essential in you know, driving the pace of economic growth. If the government wants to constrain economic growth because they're worried about inflation and the, economic, and the economy overheating, they would reduce the credit quota. And this is why things started getting a little bit out of control in the wake of the global financial crisis, because it was really in 2009 and 2010 that a shadow banking system emerged. So up until this point, the government had been or the central bank had been controlling the economy through the supply of credit and specifically through the supply of credit through the banks. But when you have the, the emergence of a shadow banking system, something that was evolving very, very quickly, something that the authorities didn't sufficiently understand, and something that would rapidly evolve around any restrictions against its growth, you had a situation where a significant amount of credit being created in the economy was occurring outside of the banks. And so the ability of the central bank to be able to control growth through the control of credit completely went out out the window. And so, um, you know, you, you had this situation where the, the firstly, you, you had credit quotas for the banks, and then you had uh, quotas on how much the banks could lend to local governments, could lend to infrastructure, could lend to property developers, could lend to heavy industry. And whenever those, in, those businesses or those, those sectors of the economy found they couldn't borrow from the banks anymore, they went to the shadow banking system. And so growth kind of continued to boom, but the financial risks continued to, to build up as well because they were occurring in a part of the system that was under-regulated. Now, 10 years on, or we're probably we're 12, 13 years on now from the emergence of the shadow banking system, as I said, shadow banking has been contracting because the government's crackdown has finally started to work in, in recent years. But also the nature of the economy has changed sufficiently such that interest rates do now have a role in shaping growth in a way that they used to, in a way that it didn't used to. So clearly state firms still play a very important role in the economy, but so do private firms, as we're seeing with companies like Alibaba and Tencent. The other really big development is that consumers, households, have become far bigger borrowers. And that's really a development that's only happened perhaps in the last five years. I mean, it was something that was still in its fairly uh, nascent stages when I was writing the book. But these days, uh, household debt levels in China, particularly in urban areas, aren't really that 
different from, say, the United States. A significant part of that borrowing is, is consumer borrowing, people borrowing money to send their kids to school or borrowing money to buy a car. But the big part is borrowing to buy an apartment. And households are far more sensitive to interest rates than state firms. And so you now do, you, you, we now are in a situation where interest rates are far more important in the Chinese economy than they have ever have been uh, up until this point. But at the same time, because of the outsized role that state firms still play in the economy, the availability and the supply, that their, their ability to access credit is still a very important um, aspect to, to what drives growth. And not everybody has access to credit unless you are big enough to be attractive or you're a part of a local government or you have some significant leverage in the at, the, at Beijing. The, if you, those of us who do not know uh, what shadow banking is, can you give us a little bit of understanding of what that is? Because it's a very different term. Generally, it's considered as a, a non-bank, unregulated financial services that could include a trust company or an asset management company or a peer-to-peer -peer lending company. Or even if I use the term in the U.S. that we have payday lending, all kinds of characters and organizations that are not regulated I guess they are all bundled along into a shadow banking. Is that correct? That is right. But I think the thing that's often overlooked is that shadow banking doesn't exist. Typically, it doesn't exist in parallel to the banking system, although there are, there are aspects of shadow banking that do, such as, say, payday lenders or, or P2P lending. But for the most part, the big and the most important parts of shadow banking actually operate hand in glove with the banking sector. And so... Uh, you know, the trust companies and securities firms, they were the perhaps the, the two key pillars of shadow banking in the Chinese system. And most of their business came from cooperating with banks to be able to make loans that the banks were unable to make. And so there is this very this, this symbiotic relationship. Um, because it is it is about regulatory arbitrage. Shadow banking exists to get around limits on the formal banking system's ability to lend. And so it makes sense for the formal banks to cooperate with non-bank financial institutions. And that is where shadow banking comes from. So the banks have customers who want to borrow and the trust management companies or asset management companies have people who have money so they can come together, work together, securitize the product, uh, and that which is not tradable as you bring it out and then of course the banks like to do it because it takes the loan off their sh balance sheet and also they make some fees out of it and that is the driver of the whole system and this is all done outside the pre purview of the regulatory system and that's a good summary but there's other stuff that goes on as well um, one of the big types of shadow banking at the moment is that the banks themselves have shadow banking assets on their own books. And so it's not the shadow banks that bring in the source of funding. The shadow, the shadow banks in some ways act as a, a beard to disguise bank loans that the banks then hold on their own books. And that's happened to a, a huge degree over the last 10 years. You know, banks aren't allowed to make a certain loan. So they'll get a trust company or a securities company, uh, sometimes both at the same time, to sort of disguise that loan as something else, something that appears on the bank's books as a receivable or a financial asset. So the bank can, continues to receive an income stream for it from it, the, in, the interest payments, but it's not recognized on its book as a loan. It's being transformed into something else. But effectively, the same, the risk profile of that asset hasn't changed. Or, as some, again, the, the the shadow banking institution isn't necessarily the the source of the of the funds, because the banks have their own customers who don't want to make a deposit, but they want some sort of investment product. And so the bank takes some of its own loans, asks the trust company to turn it into something else in that loan as what the Chinese call a wealth management product. And so there's a lot of different permutations you know, going on here. But at the end of the day, the, the, the trusts play a role in transforming what would otherwise be conventional loans into something else for regulatory purposes that the banks can either then hold on its own balance sheet or sell to its own clients or sell to the, 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 the shadow banking 
institutions owns clients for whatever reason. So there's lots of permutations here, and, and it certainly adds to the complexity of what's going on and is one of the reasons it proved so difficult to regulate for such a long time. And to those of us who are just asking questions and thinking about it, you might ask very well, why does China has so much need of shadow banking? Why people are looking for higher interest rate? Why there is so much money floating in the system? And why there are so many people willing to take so much risk to offer or lend somebody or some corporation that they may or may not know how good or how financially sound they are? Hold on to those questions. We'll come back to that later. In fact, they will get all answered as we go along. We are getting closer and closer to the wall of debt. The issue now is that you have state-owned entities, which are very large, and they have no profit motive, but they only have incentive of grow at any cost. And then you have state government officials and mayors and leaders who also want to just get bigger and bigger. So they both cons conspire to lend out more because the banks are also incentivized to lend more because Beijing wants them to lend more. That's why they are lending more. So all that leads to higher and higher debt or credit creation rather, which eventually becomes the debt. Explain to us how big money creation has become, how dangerous that has become, or in fact, more important is that rapid growth of money creation has become so dangerous that it could be very, very difficult for the Chinese leaders to control it. And also uh, on top of that, when these, uh, this credit creation is uh, done uh, at the local level, what happens to it when things don't work out? Right. So uh, about the time I was writing this book, because things have slowed down a little bit, but China's debt levels are still at a very elevated level. The time that I was writing this, the, the book, and it was published at the beginning of 2018, China's debt to GDP ratio was about 280%. 280, 280%. That's right. Now, by the standards of developed economies, that's not unusual. I mean, other large developed economies have a, a comparably large amount of debt relative to the size of their economy. However, firstly, those economies are better able to service that debt. And secondly, they've been building up that debt level over a much longer, much more prolonged period of time. Developed economies uh, have a much, much lower debt to GDP ratio, um, so, you know, usually by about lower by about 100 or, or so uh, percentage points. Now, the thing is, the China's absolute level of debt isn't really the issue. It's the concern is the pace at which that debt has accumulated. Um, and I think the level, levels now, but I think it was over about an eight year period, it increased by something like 60 or 70 percentage points. Now the thing is by global standards, by international, uh, by historical standards, when a, a country's debt to GDP has accelerated at too fast a pace, usually that ends in some sort of crisis. Now there have been examples where that hasn't been the case, but by international standards, that expansion in Chinese debt to GDP has been faster than perhaps you know any other major economy over such a short period of time in modern history. And so the concern then becomes, the reason this is a concern is that when you know an econ economy or companies or firms they deploy debt in a way that is supposed to generate a return such that that project will now of course if you're deploying too much debt too quickly then the ability to find projects that will be able to pay off that debt well it becomes more and more difficult and that is why economies end up in crisis if the pace of debt accumulation is too fast and, and so that is the risk that China has faced, that it added too much debt too quickly, such that the way it was deployed is never going to be able to pay back, be paid back, and that would potentially result in some sort of crisis. Now, since for about the last four years that the pace of, you know, the, the debt to GDP ratio hasn't been increasing anymore, it increased a little bit during the pandemic, but it's come back again, it's effectively flatlined. The government's may managed to sort of rein that in. However, we now are in this position of like, well, so much of that debt's already been extended. How much of it has been deployed efficiently and productively and how much of it will ever be paid back? 
And we've seen over the last three years a number of very high-profile um, corporate failures. 19, in 2019, we saw two major bank bailouts. Um, last year, we had two major uh, private Chinese companies that had been very acquisitive buying assets up globally. Unbung Insurance and H&A Group have had to enter restructuring, and Unbung in, in, in particular has uh, been nationalized. The government's trying to find a buyer as we speak. Um, and then at the moment, just uh, a month ago, Huarong, uh, which is a major state-owned, centrally-owned Chinese financial institution, just received a 50 billion renminbi bailout uh, from a consortium of state firms. And as we speak, there's a lot of talk about Evergrande Group, which is one of China's biggest property developers, um, and un unequivocally it's most heavily indebted, whether it is too big to fail. Because the company itself has warned that it's on a on the precipice of a de, of a default, and the question is to what extent might that royal is allowed to default? So all those problems that have uh, you know that for a long time were academic. China's debt uh, uh, accelerated very rapidly in a short period of time. It was obvious that this would cause problems at some point, but you know the economy just kept on keeping on. All of a sudden, we're now at a point where the defaults are starting to happen, and a, a, a routine question is, will this next default or this next restructuring have a meaningful impact on the stability of the financial system? There is other aspect of this thing which we haven't talked about, and that is the last aspect of our discussion, and that is about land and housing. As we all know, nobody owns land in China except the government, and government abuses that right to decide where to take the land and who to allocate and who, what, who to sell. Maybe you explain to us that how that land acquisition and then land redistribution and land marketing and sale has really led to a what what has come down to ghost cities or infrastructure that nobody generally uses. This kind of comes back also to this question of how does China repay debts for projects that don't generate a sufficient return and the answer is that the local governments sell land. So this is kind of at the very heart of uh, China's economic growth miracle or at least the way it's been over the last 20 years. That local governments uh, have the right to not only arbitrarily take land from the people living on it, whether they be uh, farmers on the outskirts of a city or, or, or sort of people uh, living on, on land that was owned or controlled by the city. Uh, there's far less of that these days, and so most of the land appropriations are, are rural land on, on the outskirts of a city. And so let's say it takes a, a farm um, and it compensates farmers for, for the land. It then rezones that land. Because there is, there's three categories of, of land. If you have agricultural land, you can't build a factory on it. You can't build an apartment building on it. Um, but you can then, once the government takes that land, it can then rezone it either into industrial land or it can rezone it into residential land. Now, the moment that a, a government rezones it into residential land, the value of that land immediately skyrockets. And so it effectively compensates farmers for agricultural land and then magically turns it into far more valuable residential land once it, it takes ownership of, of it. And then the local government might do some upgrades of it. It'll knock down whatever land, whatever buildings were originally on it. Um, it might install some roads, uh, power lines, sewer mains, and then we'll sell that land to uh, developers to build housing on it. And this really has been the major revenue generating machine for local governments. So local governments for all their subway, uh, you know, subway projects, highway projects, new tourism cities, uh, new t tourism destinations, uh, their investment in high speed rail. The way that they've funded it is they've borrowed money and the way that they've repaid those loans is by taking rural land and turning it into residential land and then selling it at a markup to property developers. And this in some, word, it has kind of, in some ways has been a perpetual motion machine. The value in, of land in China has just get, been getting higher and higher for 20 years. And so, so often we look at the price of apartments and housing in China, which has just gone up and up and up. And it looks like, it looks from the outside like a bubble. 
um, you know, the, the, the amount of, uh, of people's income, which is, you know, which has to be put aside to pay for housing is, is astronomical in some of China's biggest cities. But in some ways, what's really driving that underneath is what the developers are paying for land because the price of land just goes up, has been going up and up and up. And the authorities, the local authorities have a vested interest in seeing that continue to happen because as long as the price of land is going up, then it is, then for all intents and purposes, it forgives all sins. It gives local governments the resources with which to pay off their debts. It gives them the resources with, with which to convince banks to lend them more to, or, or, or sort of uh, the bond market to lend them more. And then, of course, um, from various uh, taxes that are associated with land and land sales and, um, and housing sales, that is a huge and vitally important source of revenue for the local governments themselves in order to provide um, public services. And so land and construction and a vibrant housing market is absolutely essential to local governments' abilities to generate growth and to be able to provide the services that they're expected to provide. And the great fear, so often that, you know, that, you know, there is a great fear that one day that, you know, China's housing prices might fall. Now, the government that the authorities at all levels have done an incredible job at ensuring that that hasn't happened in a meaningful way. And yes, there are dips in housing prices, but typically they don't last for maybe more than half a year or, or eight months. And of course, there are some real problems in, in housing markets in some parts of the country, particularly in the Northeast. But on a nationwide level, you know, land, pri land prices and housing prices have continued to go, go up. The big concern, of course, is that China is facing a demographic cliff and that all the housing that China's baby boomer generation holds that, you know, in the not so distant future, they're going to have to sell that off because that's where they've got their savings tied up in their nest egg. They'll have to sell that off at a time where there isn't a comparable, comparably large generation of, of young 20 somethings and, and 30 somethings coming through who actually want to buy housing. So you'll have a situation where there just won't be the demand for new housing at a time that people are trying to sell it off because they need it for, for retirement purposes. So there is a potential point in the foreseeable future, albeit still on the horizon, where something could go genuinely wrong with China's housing market. We don't seem to be there yet. But of course, one of the problems that that would generate is that part of China's growth machine is tied up with the construction of housing, it's tied up with the construction of infrastructure, and the way that that is funded, kind of at, at its root, sort of driving it all, is the local government's ability to take land, magically make it more valuable by making it residential and selling it off, which gives them the resources to do pretty much everything else that they need to do. And this is how they build residential units or houses or homes or apartments for 3.4 billion people, where, which to, in a country that has only 1.3 billion people. Yeah, it's, it's exactly, exactly. So you have a situation. I mean, you, you have ghost cities around the, the country. I mean, some ghost cities have filled up, but particularly in smaller cities, third, fourth, fifth tier cities, you know, you build a, a, a ghost city and you need to create industrial jobs or, or service oriented jobs in, in order to fill them. And there's real, there's no reason for those sorts of companies to move in there. I mean, the, the flow of migration in China has always been from the smaller cities to the larger cities. Um, but even in, in big cities as well, I remember when I was living in Beijing in a, in a, you know, in a newly built, a relatively newly built uh, apartment complex, all the apartments in that building had been sold and they'd been sold for, for some time. But on any given night, you'd nip, only a fraction of the lights would go on in the apartments because so many of these were investment properties. And there is, because there is no property tax in China and people don't have, you know, once they build, but once they buy an apartment, there is, they don't need to generate an income out of it. Um, and there is a, a cultural predisposition not to rent uh, because there is a sense that once renters are in, in your apartment building, it, the, the, the value of the apartment will kind of decline because renters won't take care of it properly. And so you have a situation even in developed cities where there's a real shortage of housing that people hold apartment buildings and they keep them empty. 
And it's a phenomenon that is replicated throughout the country. So often with these ghost cities, it's not just that you have apartment buildings that a developer hasn't managed to sell. They're empty apartment buildings that the developer has managed to sell. It's just that they're being held for investment purposes uh, rather than for living. So the migrant labor, which is about 280 million people now, roughly 250, 280 million, who actually lives in slums, who builds these apartments that are empty, but they don't have their own place to live. So there's going to be a huge mismatch between the people who are building the apartments who will never be able to afford to live there and the people who are buying the apartments as investment properties, but nobody's living there, which keeps the overcapacity industries like steel and cement and glass and concrete to keep humming. I couldn't have put it better myself, Manish. That's, that's the dynamic. Now, the central government's trying to work out ways to improve housing conditions for particularly for, for migrant uh, migrant workers, but it's less about selling them apartments. It's more about trying to encourage leasing, you know, uh, you know, affordable rental arrangements, which in, it hasn't been a big part of, of of the economy up until now. So they they realise that there's a problem. They're experimenting with new ideas, but the dynamic you just described that is the dominant one at the moment. And those of us who are not very familiar with the Chinese land system. Nobody owns land in China. You only lease it from the government or somebody or government authority for about 70 years as a residential and 50 years as commercial uh, properties. But everybody expects not to be taken over those properties at the end of the lease. Is that correct? That's right. So in the end, there is another issue that you bring up in the book that the construction quality also plays a role, which is a negative role that most people know this quality of the apartments is not very good, which is about 20 years at the best. So that means all you're investing is in land and not in the building. Yes, and I think it is it is going to be quite interesting to see what happens to these buildings when they get to you know, 20 years. Because as I said, I mean, China's housing market only really came into being in the late 90s. So, you know, the, the sort of the housing stock is still relatively new. It's most of it is is far newer than than twenty years. So this is kind of a question that's sort of hanging over everyone's head when people come to sell their investment apartments as part of realizing their retirement nest egg. Will that building be of sufficient quality for anyone to even want to live in there, or might they only be willing to pay a significant discount given that they realize that the, the that the building has a, a finite uh, lifespan in the in the first place, and so yeah, at the end of the day, the real value is not in the apartment because it has a finite life, but it is on the land that it's built. So the whole system has a perverse way of creating asset bubbles everywhere, and eventually there will be so many asset bubbles that the Chinese leadership may not be even able to control these bubbles, and that is really the concern. So where do we go from here? Now we know the wall, we know the debt of wall of the debt. And we, we have climbed the wall of the debt, which is almost 300%, which is not easy. And if the economy slows down, there is a middle income trap. On top of that, there's an age issue that China may get older before it gets richer, which means there are fewer people out there to work, which means that there is fewer number of people have to con contribute more into the pension system. So all that really leads to less demand for more material goods. How all that conspires in 2025, 2030, the picture doesn't look good. No, but it is it is complicated. I mean, as I sort of mentioned earlier, for the last few years, the government has been, it's firstly slowed down the pace of debt accumulation, and it's been trying to clean up the financial system. So the banks are under pressure to dispose of non-performing loans. Not, um, so at China's official bad debt levels are still incredibly low, but each year the banks are writing off more and, and more of these. Um, and at the same time, you know, some of these, as I mentioned earlier, there have been a number of big corporate failures, you know, companies going needing bailouts or restructuring. In some cases, that's been brought on by the officials themselves because they realize the problems here. Um, the, 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 the potential failure of Evergrande, this huge Chinese property developer, that's occurring because 12 months ago, the government effectively told the developers that they couldn't borrow anymore, that they had to sort of rein in their debt levels. And so in some ways, this potential default by Evergrande has been brought about by the central government 
precisely because it's trying to deal with these these problems. Now, it's important to keep in mind that it's really at the moment of reform that the potential for a crisis kind of you know looms larger because you know in its efforts to clean up its system, what if regulators take a wrong step? What if things get out of control? But at the moment, we are at a very unique point because there hasn't been a crisis, there hasn't been a collapse, and yet the authorities are kind of working overtime to make the system safer and to clean up the bad debt. Now, of course, the question here is just how long will this take? Because as the economy slows and as the property developers you know, become get under more stress, as local governments finding they can't borrow as much as they used to, so they can't roll over their debts, you know, does that, that creates stress as well. And there's real worries out there that local governments, even with land sales in their back pocket, they're not going to be able to pay off their loans. And so there is real mounting, you know, stress in the financial system. But at the same time, the authorities are really pushing hard to, to clean it up. So there is this question at the moment. Are we at a point where the, the, problems start to snowball or are we at a point where we'll look back in history where the authorities manage to take all these issues and with a deft hand manage to clean them up before they became a problem now certainly at the moment it seems to be at the la it seems to be the latter but of course the very nature of china's opaque system is such that it's very difficult to tell where the next landmine might be and that is really the thing to to watch for these massive bailouts and restructurings and corporate failures that I mentioned, will they accelerate? Will they get bigger? Will they start to affect financial institutions that are closer to the center of the economy? And if they do, then they're going to have far bigger ramific systemic ramifications than what we've seen thus far. We have been speaking with Danny McMahon, the author of Great Wall of Debt. Thank you very much for your time. And we really appreciate your views because this is it brings a different kind of perspective it, it, it kind of explains uh, differently what China has been going through, how China has evolved and changed and is in its great hurry of becoming a rich nation or becoming part of the developed nations. It has paid a heavy price and almost all these shiny towers or glistening boulevards or high speed rails that we see that is all paid by the borrowed money. This can only go so far. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Manish. It's been an excellent conversation.